Hey, it's Plant Food Chef, and today is Sunday, so that's the day that I'm always wanting to make my uh, stocks and pâtés for the week and get myself set up uh, for the whole next week. This is my fun day that I play in the kitchen and put on some good music. Today I was earlier filming my uh, wild bullet mushroom pâté uh, for the Easter dinner tonight and ended up with a lot of scraps and thought, hey, I'm going to go ahead and film the zone broth. The zone broth is my answer to the bone broth. And uh, this broth will put you in the zone better and in a more healthy way than any bone broth. And I'll argue that with any meat eater. So this is a mineral rich broth that you cook for hours so that you really pull out the minerals. Yes, I am into... Uh, the benefits of raw vegan food and of living foods, but I also am into being smart in the kitchen and I'm all about the flavors. And so I love to hybridize a recipe that is 90% raw, but I might want to bring in some flavorful broth. And why not? I've been teaching raw vegan for se over seven years at one of the most spectacular schools in the world and the truth is I can teach up to a gourmet level all of the best of raw foods and living foods and sure I can keep those recipes 100% raw but at home when I'm not teaching at school I have more fun with it I'm not afraid of heat heat's been a part of our journey for a long time and so I can do 100% raw broth as well but there's all those scraps all week that pile up, and many of them uh, can contribute great minerals uh, to a good broth that is the equivalent of a great pho or a great uh, uh, bone broth. In this case, zone broth, uh, because this is going to be a plant-based version of many of the same benefits that people get from cooking down bones, um, which do release minerals. Now bones also have all kinds of uh, toxins built up in the marrow that's being released as well into the bone broth. And most of the animals that are used to make any commercial bone broth especially have been fed all kinds of hormones and chemicals that I don't want to dance with. This is a great response to that. Um, and it is a play on words, and so this is my zone broth. So, all week, as I'm going along creating my salads and all my different things, if I see something that is starting to turn and I know will be great for the broth because I'm going to make my broth every Sunday, it's just what I do, um, I will put it into a container. These, by the way, and you've heard of the green bags. The green bags let off the gases from vegetables um, but don't let them come back into them. If I had put these same vegetables into just a plastic bag I had recycled um, from the grocery store or something, they're going to get slimy. They're not going to make it to Sunday. They're going to be in bad shape. This container allow, will hold vegetables up to two weeks without going bad. I'm not kidding. Um, somebody gave me this as a gift. Usually I don't buy a lot of plastic. In fact, I don't use plastic at all, but this is pretty miraculous. It was created for the space program to hold the freshness of produce longer. And that's where the technology came from. These are amazing. Um, I'd look them up if I was you. In fact, I'll put a link below the video um, to show you uh, what these are about. They're amazing. So, during the week, I'm just going to be gathering up Various, you know, these were some celery stalks that were getting a little old um, to the point where I didn't want to use them for herbs. Those go in. Um, some extra parsley that was turning a little on the yellow side, maybe. Uh, dark leafy greens are great to put in here. Um, they're great sources for all kinds of minerals. I have some uh, zucchini from the uh, lasagna that I was sheeting out uh, and making plant-based uh, pasta. Uh, this week in the vegan fusion class I was teaching in 
online with Boulder, some mushrooms that were getting a little on the slimy side. So I saved them to throw into my stock um, and just various other, anytime I have onion skins or any alliums, garlic, shallots, onions, these skins are so rich in many different uh, nutrients and they create such a depth of flavor for any stock. Get those in there. You know, I've got little tails and ends of all kinds of stuff in here, including uh, parsnips, carrots, many, many different things can go into it. I've got some extra oregano from the lasagna I was making. That's going to go in. Love the flavor of oregano in a good stock. Um, the parts of the squash, I am cut up some squash. This is actually for another food demo I'm going to be filming uh, about my raw uh, butternut squash uh, pasta. Believe it or not, yes, it's a pasta that's made in, a, in the dehydrator. So, and these are spinach that was getting a little, you know how spinach is. Sometimes it just gets a little bit on the edge. And dark leafy greens, like I said, are great to put into a zone broth. They're going to bring in a lot of great stuff. So, and any kind of salad greens, dark leafy greens, you have extra to that end. I was at the farmer's market and I always look for beets, carrots, any root vegetables with the greens on. I want the greens. Uh, either I'm going to be juicing with them or finding many different creative things to do with them. Beet greens are delicious in a salad, but they're a powerhouse in a soup stock. And I got some beautiful beets at the farmer's market here. And so I'm gonna take the greens off one of these. I'm not gonna use up all the greens uh, on my beets uh, because uh, I, I love to juice them, and I also just like to put them in salad. You know, I, I love beet greens. They're, they're just amazing. And so I will save some of that. Um, I have the tops from the spring onion that I was chopping earlier. Uh, onions are a great part of a soup stock. I always have the mirepoix present in here. Uh, for those who don't know what that is, that's just your onions, carrots, and celery. The base in, in French cooking. It's, it just is that wonderful umami flavor that we always want to have in a good soup. So I'm always going to have some carrots and celery and onions in one form or another in there. Could be green onions, could be red onions, could be sweet onions, could be shallots, you know, any of that kind of thing is for sure going to be in here. I always have some garlic in here. And all the peelings from the paper, from the garlic, like I already mentioned, throughout the week are also going to be going in here. I just give this a good crush and throw it in. Doesn't matter. Um, all the paper, everything can go straight in. I like a little spice in my stock. You don't have to. Um, but I do like to have a little bit of spice in there. If I was really dicing this up a lot, I'd put a little pepper board down, but I wasn't. I was doing a pretty simple cut. That's a Fresno chili. I love Fresno chilies. Um, I was just popping it open there so the seeds can get into there, uh, which will actually give me a little bit more heat. I love heat in my soup stock. Um, these were from the butternut squash that I will be using to make, uh, like I said, a raw butternut squash pasta with. But I kept the seed bed part um, when I cut off the bottoms on the butternut. And those are going to go in there with the seeds. These seeds have a lot of great stuff in them. So all these things are going to be bringing different minerals into this broth. And of course, minerals are, have a lot to do with the different colors in food. So make your broth filled with all kinds of beautiful, beautiful colors. Okay. And I had an extra beet um, from last week. I fell to the back of the fridge and got all, I'm not gonna cut it on the wood board because <laughs> it'll turn my board permanently purple for a while. Um, but I'm gonna throw that in there. Beets are incredible in a soup stock. Um, so just cutting it up to give it more surface area and throw that in there. You'll, you'll see when you do that, of course, you're gonna have the most gorgeous stock color. Uh, kind of this purplish uh, brown uh, stock. It's very clear and deep. Love that. A little bit more parsley that I have that need to use up. Uh, I'll be getting some fresh parsley probably tomorrow. 
I like to throw in some ginger. That's kind of a variable one. Um, but I, I buy ginger in large quantities and sometimes some of it's getting a little bit dried up. Don't worry about peeling. This is organic. I rinsed it off, just chop it up. Skin and all. The skin many times has some of the most powerful elements that we want to go into the stock. Okay, so just throw the whole thing in. Um, any extra mushrooms you have that might be getting a little bit slimy or dried up, make sure to throw them in. Uh, those are great. And then dried mushrooms. Dried mushrooms give that really deep umami uh, or udati, depending on who's making the soup, uh, to a soup. I have some dried porcinis or belites, um, which I have harvested here on the Mendocino coast. Those are going in. I love those. And I don't ever let mushrooms go to waste. If, if they're not going in the soup stock, they're going in the dehydrator. Sometimes I, you know, they're on sale and I'll buy a big container of cremini mushrooms. And I just, if I didn't use them up all in time, I'm going to dry them in the dehydrator. So I've got some creminis to throw in there too. In mushrooms, I like to put different levels of flavor into a stock. Shiitake, another great favorite of mine for flavoring up. And earlier when I was making the belit um, pate, I was soaking my dried belites in boiled water to get them a little cooked, uh, which is the safe way to use wild mushrooms. But it gave me a, a wonderful mushroom soaking water, so of course that's going to go into the stock. So now we've got just all kinds of incredible, incredible colors and textures and flavors going on in here with the squashes and the beets and the greens and the mushrooms and the celery and the alliums, you know, the different kinds of onions and garlic. Of course, I'm going to throw some carrots in there. Uh, these ones were getting a little bit older. I just bought a fresh batch at the farmer's market, so we'll throw some of those in there. I love the flavor of carrots in a good stock. And I'm actually going to go back over here and take off the tops on these carrots um, and throw those in there too. Now, I either am going to save carrot tops for my soup stock or one of my all-time favorite pestos is carrot top pesto. So, and I'll be posting a recipe for that uh, to you. So you'll see that on my YouTube channel, but I love to just buy the carrots with the biggest bunch of greens on them. There's so many different wonderful ways that you can use them. But they, they add just an incredible sweet, yummy flavor that's even different than the carrots in the background in a good stock. So I love putting carrot greens into my stock. I actually can tell when I haven't put them in. So uh, they're a favorite. I'll actually seek out some carrots with tops when I know it's about time to make a good stock. So let's see, I think I got everything out of there that I wanted. And then one last thing that I'm gonna bring into it, and this is a fantastic one and easy to get over here in the Mendocino coastline, especially in California, because we happen to be one of the most uh, prolific places in the world that you can harvest your own, and that's seaweed. Seaweed has such an incredible array of minerals in it. It's, it's a powerhouse food. Um, I have wakami that has been, that I actually harvested myself and dried uh, from the beaches down here, uh, south of here, where there's beaches that are far from any towns. I find a good secluded beach that has great rocks and, and shallow areas where you can find a wide array of seaweeds. And here in the Northern California coast, all seaweeds are edible, all of them. There's one sea palm, which I love, that you cannot get your on your own because it became endangered, it was being over harvested. So you gotta get permits for that. I just get that from an operation here in town. So I'm putting this wonderful wakami in there. And then this is sea palm. I actually have some sea palm as well. And the sea palm um, was harvested here in Mendocino. And so that's going in with the wakami. And then I'm ready to just fill this up. Just to play it safe, I always like to filter the water that I'm cooking with. I'll refill this a few times and get this filled all the way up. Um, I can, once a week, remove the cutting board from my stove, 
don't use the stove quite as much as most people, uh, seeing as that I am predominantly living foods. Uh, and that's just going to go on the stove and fill it with water, put a lid on. You will, every now and then, every few hours, stop by and check it out and put some more water in because the water is going to go down, even with a lid on. Um, but that's fine. You know, let it cook down. Let it really cook down and pull out the minerals. We're not going for phytonutrients. We're not going for vitamins. We're not going, you know, for enzymes. We're going for minerals. This is a mineral-rich broth. I'm just as prone to going into the fridge and grabbing a, a mason jar of stock and warming it up a little bit and sipping it like a tea. It's really great for... Uh, hydrating and bringing a lot of minerals to you and it's a great way to make sure that you're utilizing all the beautiful gifts from all this produce that Gaia gives us. So uh, that's my zone broth, an important part of my uh, busy day on Sunday in the kitchen where I'm having fun and just getting set up for the week. Okay, so it's been a few hours since I got my soup stock started. And this is production day, like I said. This is Sunday where I'm prepping and getting things ready for the week. And so any little projects that I want to have going on, I'm going to check out or, or set up today. So while the soup was cooking down and I was keeping an eye on it, I was also uh, setting up for my next round of microgreens and sprouts. Let's get back to the zone broth. Now this, as I said earlier, has cooked for about four or five hours and it did drop down in volume and then I would bring it back up and eat twice. I, think I checked it twice and added some more water. I like to get a good amount of stock. Now we are going to take the stock and transfer it through a sieve, of course, uh, to get all the veggies out. So I'm going to start with just going in with a Pyrex glass measuring cup here and taking some of that wonderful rich hot broth and starting to pour it through into my secondary stock pot here. It smells incredible. I can tell you this is so rich and so flavorful. It is a game changer. Now, I'm gonna be going into some jars, you know, and, and depending on your size of your fridge and or the, the size of jars that you like to freeze or the size you're most likely to grab for what you want to make with your broth, uh, we'll predict what size you wanna go into. I'm gonna be, go, I'll show you uh, going into a quart jar, into a half gallon jar. I love these stainless steel funnels that are made for getting things into, uh, easily getting things into mason jars. Everything from the small uh, pint jars to the quart to the gallon, these really make your life easy. I do a lot of fermenting. I'm always packing in, you know, brines or vegetables or whatever, and this is just a good tool to have. Uh, I, I recommend that you get some of these. If you want um, to take a little bit more of the finer things out of here, you can. Uh, I have different uh, size sieve mesh uh, in my kitchen, and so I have fine meshes too. And if I was really wanting to get a much clearer broth with any little bits, because this this is a larger mesh here, there's some things that are going to fall through here. Um, I can go then and. Uh, Pour it through a finer sieve as I go into the jar. Finish this one off. Now here's a tip if you're going in the freezer. Okay, if you're going to be freezing your broth and you know that that's the outcome for it, the question comes up about can I freeze in mason jars? I've had them explode. Well, a few different things to be aware of. Yes, you can, number one. But, um, you don't want to fill it up past the shoulder here. You're gonna be wanting to stay down and even a little lower than this one. Force them out here. And 
and change the view so I can point this out really up close here. Give yourself some space here. When liquid freezes, it expands, okay? And if you take it down to the shoulder level and then go down a little bit more even and just let that cool off, um, absolutely let it cool off. And I mean that. <laughs> Don't ever put things into, for, for numerous reasons, it's just not food safe to be putting hot liquid into your freezer. Be aware that as it goes and free and expands in there and gets into the narrow neck area, that's what's gonna crack the jar. Okay, that's number one. Now, the second thing is when you put this in the freezer, once it's totally cooled down to room temperature, do not put the lid on yet. Put it in the freezer, and then come back about two hours later. It'll mostly be frozen. You'll see it's, you know, um, setting up through there and freezing. Then you can put your lid on and tighten it down. You don't have any pressure inside the glass. I do this all the time. I never have them break. As long as you uh, use this kind of thought, you, you've got to think about it. You can't just throw anything into a mason jar and fill it up and throw it in the freezer and expect that it's not going to break. Fluids expand when they freeze. Give them the space to expand and then you're good as gold. And of course in the pint jars, uh, choose your pint jars that don't have a shoulder. Uh, choose the ones that are straight, the wide-mouthed pint jars. That's the best for the freezer because there's no little shoulder to even deal with. I wish they made the quart jars straight up. Everyone that ferments wishes that. When you're stacking in straight uh, asparagus standing on end. In Europe, they make straight jars that go right up for the wide mouth top. That's a whole other subject that I'll get into in a fermentation class. I love these lids. Uh, Ball makes these leak-proof lids. Look for these. Now there's also the white lids uh, that are inexpensive that you can buy. And you can see that up here where I'm storing dried like pineapple. You know, when I have an extra pineapple, I chop it up and dehydrate it. Love these. These are pineapple chips. Crunchy like a potato chip. So good. In fact, I'm going to leave one out to eat. Every time I open this jar, I go on a little munchy attack. But these are those jar lids that are the cheap ones. And they're inexpensive. You can buy these uh, at, on Amazon or, you know, uh, from any kind of canning supply. And they don't have any little flange on the inside that is going to lock on to the rim and prevent them from spilling. So when you're putting fluids and or ferments uh, into a jar, uh, I would recommend that you invest in some of these. They're not that expensive. These are BPA, totally food safe. They have a little rim inside of here. Let's see if we can. Yeah, it's going to show. So there's a little rim inside here um, that, that actually tightens down. It's just coming in at like a 45 degree angle. And when I tighten that down onto this jar, if this is totally cool, of course I'm going to let this stock cool off before I put it in the fridge or the freezer. If I'm going to be going in the fridge and putting it on its side, it's not going to spill. That white lid that I just showed you on the dried pineapple will be dripping all over in my refrigerator and making a mess. And I quickly realized uh, that the white ones are inexpensive for a reason. They're great. And they, they're, they're sealed enough to keep uh, a crispiness. Uh, this up here, by the way, is all of my legumes, my nuts, my seeds, everything that can be, and my rices. Uh, and yes, in raw food, I do use black. Uh, forbidden rice and wild rice, uh, which will bloom without cooking. And I still on those don't want those metal lids. I just have a thing about the metal lids with mason jars. So I buy uh, the white lids, which are super affordable for a huge pack of the wide mouth or regular size. But just know, you put them on something fluid and go to put it in the fridge and it tips over, or if you're just saving space in the fridge and you want to put it on its side, it's going to spill. So just remember, don't fill them all the way, and that's only if you're going in the freezer. If you're going in the fridge, fill them right up to the top, put the tight lid on, but don't put them in the fridge or the freezer 
until your stock has totally cooled down. Always let your stock or anything come to the room temperature and then put it in the fridge. Uh, that's just good kitchen etiquette. Oh, so good. So good. And uh, just that one, that one Fresno pepper I put in here gave this just enough kick in the background that there's another layer of heat that I love. I love, I, I absolutely love putting a little bit of dried pepper. By the way, dried uh, uh, chipotle, uh, fr uh, uh, fresh pepper is what I put in with the Fresno. But if you don't have fresh peppers, just a little piece of chipotle pepper. Uh, dried Chipotle or dried uh, Anaheim or California chili, whatever, if you just want a little kick. And I, I, I actually love a little bit of spiciness in my broth. Um, this is a well-rounded, deep flavor with many different levels of flavor going on. When I take a, a bite of it, or a sip of it, I guess you would say, I can taste uh, really deep notes, middle notes, higher notes, it even has a saltiness. Uh, a, a beet greens, celery, especially char chard, uh, a lot of the different greens have a certain amount of sodium they bring. So even for those that don't want to put extra salt in, and I haven't put salt in here yet, this is an incredibly deep, rich, mineral-filled broth that will uh, be a great boon to any salt-free cooking. Now, that being said, if you know you like a little bit deeper flavor um, and you want it to be a little saltier, what I would recommend is putting in, and I use a low-sodium organic tamari, just a splash of tamari, and you can sit here and stir it in at this level if you want, and it will deepen the flavor just a little bit. You'll see it adds another layer of umami to it. You cannot buy as good a stock as this. And most people don't put a lot of thought into their broth. And remember all of those wonderful things that you saw me putting into this, and you'll end up with a deep, rich broth that'll take your cooking to another level. So there we have it. The zone broth, not bone broth. And I know you're gonna love it. I certainly do. The recipe is gonna be down below. And if you have any questions, of course, shoot, hit me up with the questions and I'll troubleshoot anything with you. Uh, make sure, again, to hit the like button and the subscribe button uh, to keep up with all of the great tips that I bring uh, to the Living Food Kitchen. Watch for Plant Food Chef on YouTube and on Pinterest and on Instagram and on Facebook. And uh, you can contact me for private coaching and or uh, jumping into the Living Foods courses that I have coming.